10 years ago, uh, we had liver transplantation. Now there are two oral TTR tetramer protein stabilizers. There are two um, RNA modifying agents. Uh, how do you guys use these agents? And then I've got an even tougher question after that. So Jim, why don't you start off? How do you use these agents? When do you use one versus the other? Well, so I really sort of talk to the patients about uh, patisseran versus inotercin, you know, explain to them the way we're gonna give it, explain to them the side effects, and essentially let the patients decide which one they will go with. Now, some of it may be their insurance companies may also have a say on which they'll pay for and which they won't pay for, so it may not entirely be their decision. I also think deflunazole with these agents potentially has a role that we'll use a stabilizer and a knockdown therapy together. And why would you use combined therapy? Well, so one of them is knocking down TTR by about 80%, but still there's gonna be 20% of TTR remaining in that patient. And so stabilizing that so it's not going to form amyloid, theoretically, that makes some sense to me. And is there any role for a TTR a tetramer stabilizer independent of a gene silencer? Well, I think absolutely there's a role for that because I think there will be people without insurance. There will be people who can't afford, again, these are very expensive drugs. So deflunazole is a relatively inexpensive drug. So I think that there is a role for that, absolutely. Michael. So I think that deflunazole is the perfect solution for somebody who's early on, who's having symptoms, but neither I nor the patient are sure what they mean which means that there's no objective neuropathy. The exam is quite good. Uh, so it's not clear if they've begun the cascade of amyloid deposition. So that would be, that's a great patient to put on the flunazel uh, because we're potentially stalling or delaying the development of symptomatic disease. Uh, in terms of a symptomatic patient uh, uh, you know, with HATTR, I, I think that silencer or knocked out drugs are the way to go, uh, uh, not considering cost or other issues. I think they have, uh, the, the data looks better. Now, if there's a patient who might experience some progression or if you want to be extra conservative to add a, a stabilizer drug would make sense. Um, so if I'm getting this correctly from you both, uh, the feeling is that when symptomatic, that TTR gene silencing therapy is mandatory. Mandatory is a strong word, but I think it's certainly preferable. Advised. Yeah, advised, yeah. Yeah, I agree. The data from the trials suggest that the neuropathy has stopped or even improved the TAD. Ah, improved. Yeah, that, that, that's all about. John, I know that you'd had this beautiful study in JAMA about deflunazole. And so in no way am I trying to detract from the work that you have done <laughs> in supporting the gene uh, silencing drugs. But, but, but they both showed that a sizable number of patients actually stabilized or even improved. Now, L-Nylum, Apollo, Petisteran, I think had slightly more, and so I think that company likes to tout that. But again, I would advise not to make too much of that, but I think it's very exciting that in both studies there was improvement in some of the patients. Michael? Um, no, I agree. Okay. Um, so the only editorial comment I'd have is that in the diflunosol trial, for the people who um, took diflunosol for a full 24 months, that 30%, uh, actually 29%, but we'll round up to 30%, uh, actually had no progression of neuropathy by complex composite um, scoring. 
Um, so I, uh, I think deflunazole is a great option for people without insurance and that. Well, I don't know what the, I don't know how these drugs will be best used. Um, although I think you could make an argument that you could, um, in people who are early in disease, you could start them on an oral agent and monitor them. Um, and uh, if they demonstrated any neurologic progression, uh, then you would be on solid grounds to um, uh, augment uh, or completely change therapies. Um, so I think you both make uh, excellent points. Um, now the more difficult um, uh, topic, and that is um, you know people are genopositive uh, for a mutation that um, if it manifests has devastating effects. Uh, do you put people on treatment prophylactically uh, without any evidence uh, of neuropathy or cardiomyopathy? I've talked to the companies, both of them, about this issue because I think this is the place to do studies. I mean, to me, that's research, and I think it's a great study to do. They ought to, similarly to the way they've done these other studies, put a group of patients on uh, treatment and another group on placebo and see if they can show that they can delay or abort onset of cardiomyopathy or neuropathy by doing that. Michael? So I agree it's a great trial, a great study to be done. Uh, in today's world, it, it's difficult to prescribe uh, these drugs for asymptomatic patients. I mean, if you could get it approved, which was a big if, uh, I think it's difficult to do. So you don't know if they're going to develop the disease ever, and if they are, when they'll develop it. It's a tough trial to design, isn't yeah. it? I mean, you'd sure. need a large number of patients, oh, variable it's a, it's a, penetrance. It, 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 uh, it would take a long time uh, of follow-up to basically ascertain that. No, it's a, very really hard, it's a very hard study to do. And, and again, one would probably take family history and see when your parents became involved. But it, as we've talked about, there's variable penetrance, so that would be imperfect too. 